After Lord Tengen is defeated and absorbed by Kenjaku, the preparations for the merging of all Japan with Nirvana is about to begin. Before the citizens of the nation can be fused to create a curse spirit fueled by the millions of innocent souls, the remaining Jujutsu sorcerers, not tainted by evil, assess their situation. With Yuki Sakumo gone, but the back of the prison realm safe, along with just enough points to enact the plan their long, grueling stretch through the culling game was even started for. Our protagonists persevere with their attempt to unseal Satoru Gojo and substitute Tsumiki Fushiguro, Megami's previously comatose sister, out of the death game with 100 points as the cost. It seems the curse that incapacitated her was actually a curse technique that was struggling to awaken. But once all of Kenjaku's binding vows were released, she was able to evolve completely into a sorcerer. Convenient, Maki is able to drop Sumiki off, despite her not being able to come with at first. And everything seems to be going perfect, with Sumiki and the transfer of points all going off without a hitch. Itadori knows his time with everyone is coming to an end. As once Gojo is free and Angel eliminates Sakuna within him, Yuji's role will come to an end. What could possibly interrupt this moment? Kogane at a rule that allows free entry and exit between colonies. In a shocking turn of events, the person standing before them, who they thought to be Megami's caring and loving older half-sister, was actually a reincarnated sorcerer, an evil, heinous curse user from the Heian era no less. All this time, despite meeting on multiple occasions and waiting out on the culling game for days for the cast to accomplish their goal, this Yorozu never once broke character. Fushiguro, his spirit utterly crippled, the look of despair pouring off of his face that could only helplessly ask this demon why, for all of this time, would they play with his emotions like this? And Yorozu can't help but find the entire ordeal hilarious, a free 100 points and their unconditional offer of trust right from the very beginning? How could she not accept such a beneficial head start in reviving? And all that waiting and trickery paid off as now, not only is she free to act, at the start, her rule change allows her to pick where and who her first battle will be with in over 1,000 years, and Yorozu declares his opponent to be Sukuna, before launching off like a rocket in the direction of Sendai Colony. Yuji and Angel, using her own play capabilities, resolve to give chase and immediately try to go after this Yorozu, but of all times, in chain. Two conditions. Sakuna gains full control for an entire minute as long as no one is harmed and Itadori will forget about this binding vow. This situation goes from terrible to worse. Sukuna instantly takes advantage of the chaos and knocks Hanakarusu unconscious, being careful to catch her just before she falls as to not break the vow him and Yuji agreed upon. An already broken Megami can only ask why Sukuna is now appearing as well, but the vengeful spirit is much more focused on accomplishing his own goal in this time limit. Sukuna infused uses all of his energy into a single finger of Itadori's and plucks it from the stem, risking it all on this single act of violence. But as all lies calm and still afterwards, Sukuna can't help but shatter that silence with a loud and maniacal laughter. For Yuji's self-righteous deprecation and belief that his role is merely to exist as a cog and not as a real person who deserves any acknowledgement or protection, to explain it in simple terms, it basically means that despite Yuji claiming Sukuna couldn't hurt anyone, Itadori hates himself so goddamn much he himself was not included on that list of people that couldn't be hurt. Self-inflicting pain on Itadori is free game inside Sukuna and Yuji's binding vow. Before Sukuna can gloat too much about his elaborate plan, a sinister aura surges over from Megami's direction. The distraught young clan head has had had enough, and in a self-destructive act, plans to summon Divine General Maharaga in a suicide pact once more, and attempt to snuff out Sukuna once and for all. But Sukuna's wise to the boy's tricks now, ripping the child's arms out of sequence and disrupting the hand signs. Before Megami even knows it, Sukuna's pulling apart his jaw and force-feeding the cursed object to his long-awaited prize, and as consciousness flashes. 
Itadori awakens while Fushiguro becomes trapped in never-ending sleep. A meeting the two never thought would happen, physically at least. You know, face to face. Itadori Yuji locks eyes with his nemesis, Ryomen Sukuna. Except this time, it's in the body of his best friend, Fushiguro Megami. Doing his best to slick back that sea urchin hair in the classic King of Curses fashion. As an even darker, shadowy presence emanates from Fushiguro. Before Itadori even has time to comprehend the loss of his friend, or Pinky, the newly transformed Zenin clan head ripples through the sound barrier and chooses Itadori's stomach as the shattering point, a punch that almost forces Yuji's stomach from his throat. The boy is sent rocketing through multiple buildings, but like the tank he is, Yuji somehow manages to stay in one piece. Noticing this burst of energy, both Fumihiko Takaba and Maki Zenin attempt to close in on the area and investigate, but Sukuna, sensing this disturbance from miles away snickers at the idea of the insects below even thinking they stand a chance not now not after he's obtained his treasure like a demon overlooking the sky of the city Nue, or at least what Saguna refers to as Nue, emerges from the shadows and towers over the city maki and takaba have barely a second to gaze up at its monstrous form before lightning bolts the size of heaven rain down upon them Only only just barely disrupted by the arrival of Hanukarusu and Angel, using their technique to deflect at least some of the Thunder Blast, shielding his eyes from the light casted by this holy figure. Even now, it's clear the Angel's power opposes the vengeful spirit, but Karusu chooses to hold back in fear of harming Megami and collateral damage. Angel claims they have no choice though. The Fallen One has taken Fushiguro as his vessel, and their only hope of saving him, if they even can, is a eliminating Sukuna's essence as fast as possible, and asking questions later. Chanting a hymn, which awakens the true, unrestricted power of Angel's ancient curse technique, Jacob's Ladder. A humongous seal inscribes the sky above before igniting the area in a burst of light that vaporizes all evil intent in the surrounding range. A holy attack that reduces the King of Curses to a wailing rodent, yelping in pain as Hana presses more power into her ability, calling out for Megami to survive the intense blessings of the gods themselves. And like a wish come true, as the darkness becomes swallowed by light, Megami awakens and calls out to Hana, holding his hand out and thanking her for saving him. Everything worked exactly as planned. I mean, Angel is basically screaming at us, telling us that it is isn't safe, and I've never seen Megami's mouth stretch that wide, but I guess everything's all good. <laughs> just like a curse, twisting the emotion of love and using it against humanity. Hana was fooled by the king of all of them. Her arm torn and immediately being disposed of like a rag doll. Itadori Yuji, finding himself recovered from that exploded solar plexus, can only stand there and watch. As Hana's lifeless body drops from the story's tall skyscraper, the king of curses now stands atop of. Hopping up and crash landing on one of the buildings adjacent to the venture spirit. Sukuna seems annoyed that Itadori even decided to stick around. This was the final straw though. The building beneath Yuji crumbles under the force of his jump as the child throws himself and all of his might at the King of Curses. Surprising even Sukuna himself as Yuji's hand reaches for the King's throat. The two slam through a nearby building and Sukuna finds himself on the back foot, wondering where the surge of strength is coming from. But as soon as the King looks up, a piece of that skyscraper is inches away from smashing into his forehead. The large debris kicked into Sukuna's arms by a bloodlusted Itadori. The brawler is running fast enough to catch up with the rocketing King of Curses and shift behind it, gearing up to smack him together like a sandwich with a street sign Yuji found lying around. The King of Curses somehow dodges and roundhouses some sense back into the teenager, realizing this obscene powerhouse of a nuisance is probably one of Jaku's experiments. Yuji, frankly, is just fucking tired though. He's tired of dealing with curses and their need to ruin everything. And the answer to Yuji's question is a slice attack right to the torso, reverberating across his chest and splattering blood. While Yuji stopped in his tracks, Sukuna poses an alternate theory. Why do humans oppose their fate despite being too weak to ever change it? They don't deserve happiness if they'll never be strong enough to go out and achieve it themselves. 
so they should just stop wishing for it. Itadori decides it's pointless to debate philosophy with a curse, and instead chooses to speak to the vengeful spirit in his own language. Bloodlust and fucking carnage, with his negative energy swirling up larger than ever before, like a natural born juggernaut. Itadori Yuji walks through a torrent of cleave attacks like it's nothing, his skin splitting and covering himself in blood. Itadori pushes through the storm to his goal, staring doom in the face. Sakuna wonders why Itadori is so strong, but that isn't it. Sakuna's attack power is beginning to fail, almost as if something is suppressing it. Ah, fuck. Despite being suppressed by the King of Curses, Fushiguro Megami's will cannot be defeated. Even submerged in darkness, he can force Sakuna's cursed energy output to below even 10% of Sakuna's usual strength. Sakuna thinks it should be more than enough to take care of Yuji at least though. The real monster of this generation arrives to offer help to her underclassmen, and even Sukuna himself notes her power level to come out completely unscathed from Nue's lightning bolt by assuring Maki that no matter how hard she comes at this newly possessed Megami, the body won't actually perish. No more words even need to be exchanged. Like moths to flame, the two of them pounce on Sukuna with varying levels of success. Surprisingly enough, when it comes to hand-to-hand, -hand, Maki is able to match Sukuna perhaps even more than, instantly gaining the upper hand and launching him out of the small garage they found themselves in. Yuji is quick with the assist, using the railing of the garage to whip up Sukuna like a rope and hold him in place for Maki to land another critical hit. This ultimately amounts to no damage though, and Maki asks Yuji if he'll be able to keep up if she can speed things up a bit, to which both Itadori and Sukuna prepare for the incoming assault. Just ripping through the city, Maki and Yuji attempt to use teamwork to over overwhelm the King of Curses and combine their overwhelming attack power by having Maki throw Yuji at Sukuna directly. But Sukuna can easily take the two of them if it's just melee. In fact, the King of Curses deduces if the body resists to attacking his friends with Cleave, it's doubtful Fushiguro would be so protective over things like the ground. In the confusion of the exploding floor, Sukuna is able to land a counterattack on Maki, but the newly awakened beast of the Zenin clan takes a punch from the King of Curses is like it's nothing, much to Sukuna's enjoyment. The two of them exchange blows back and forth at intense speeds, with again the clash between them ending in a draw. But before the fight can continue, another bloodlusted aura enters the arena, putting a freeze on the entire location before a single person even has time to react, conjuring a glacier of immense proportions. Truly a sight to behold if you're, you know, not inside of it. Rame, right hand servant of Ryomin Sukuna is the one who interrupted the battle, and despite expecting reprimand from the king, Sukuna admits he couldn't really care either or if the fight continued. The vengeful spirit is much more interested in securing this new vessel, and ensuring mishaps like the reduction in cursed energy don't happen again. Originally, Arame had chosen not to kill Maki or Yuji, thinking Sukuna might have still had a use for the child, but the latter admits Sukuna only really likes to keep Itadori around to laugh at his sorrow. Truly, a curse deserving the title of king. Wasting absolutely no time, the King of Curses drowns himself in evil, coating his new vessel in a darkness untouchable by things like human will or consciousness, suffocating Fushiguro Megami's soul in corruption. Although the ritual is not yet complete, one thing remains in order to seal the deal, and that's murdering Fushiguro's sister, Sumiki, or rather, eliminating its new host, the one responsible for all of this, Yorozu, the fellow Heinera sorcerer lies in wait for the King of Curses in the colony of Sendai, and within moments of Sukuna making entrance to the colony, his dark presence ruptures the current established status. Both surviving the deadlock earlier, Uro Takako and Ishiguri Ryu shudder as the King of Curses' overwhelming power creates a heavy weight throughout the colony. And while Uro makes the smart decision of hiding, it seems Ishiguri bit off a little more than he could chew, challenging the vengeful spirit 
and within moments, most likely regretting his actions that led to it. Getting lucky and surviving Sukuna's first attack, the Demon King vows not to underestimate Ishigori a second time. And now fully warmed up and ready to unlock his full potential, Sukuna meets Yorozu for battle in the center of Sendai's giant stadium. And at first, attempting to share some form of familiarity, Yorozu asks why Sukuna chooses to stick with Megami's visage. But Sukuna claims they don't need to exchange pleasantries for long, as he says, Yorozu won't be around for long anyway. Two thick black tendrils rip through the air to strike at Sukuna, but the king easily avoids. Yorozu surfing on a third of these tendrils, presses into Sukuna's range, and the two exchange blows even. As Sukuna kicks her away and they assume a neutral position, a powerful hay and arrow witch like Yorozu is surprisingly keeping up with and jumping into battle with a powerhouse like Sukuna. Comfortable enough to get close and personal when most really wouldn't. Using her construction curse technique, just like Mai Zenin, at a young age, Yorozu realized the inefficiency of the ability's consumption of energy. Even though Yorozu had cursed energy reserves on par with the legends of the era, construction was always a hefty cost. Searching for an answer for years, Yorozu came to research how insects were able to use their small bodies to perform amazing feats seemingly impossible at their size. By translating this efficiency into how she used her construction, she discovered what she calls liquid metal, a black substance that can hold her cursed energy indefinitely and allow her to construct different shapes. This was only the tip of the iceberg of the tricks up Yorozu's sleeve, a sorcerer that was able to defeat reputable forces back in the day, like the five void generals. But being strong made Yorozu arrogant and dismissive of the people around her. It wasn't until she laid eyes on the king, a man who had achieved such great strength that no one could stand beside him. A look of loneliness that only a strong woman, a sorcerer who persevered like him, could quell. And through this one-sided and undying love, Yorozu sought to chase Sakuna into the next life. Noticing the vengeful spirit hiding within Itadori Yuji when even the angel, who was specifically looking for Sakuna, could not. Love so true that she would only be willing to die by his hand, and she hopes she could be the one to kill him as well, if he'll have her. And the disinterested Sakuna, seeing only his goal in front of him, painfully agrees to Yorozu's binding vow that if Sakuna perishes in this fight with her, Yorozu may marry his corpse. And just this promise alone is enough to ignite the fire in Yorozu's eyes. But just as she begins to resolve and take this fight seriously, Sakuna summons his newly modified version of the divine dog Shikigami in attack mode. Yorozu is quick and uses her construction to shatter the dog's form, but as the smoke clears, it's only Sakuna and an even larger divine dog that meet her gaze. Sakuna's usage of the ten shadows allows him to partially manifest the Shikigami, meaning they change form and can't be destroyed. But Sakuna isn't the only one whose weapons shapeshift, attempting to completely crush the King of Curses inside a needled ball of liquid metal. Sakuna is already leagues above and ahead of Yorozu. Just as Yorozu's tendrils are about to make a second attack, she stops everything. Even Sakuna's kind of confused. Yorozu doesn't understand why Sakuna's choosing to use his vessel's curse technique instead of his own ability, but it's very important for the ritual, at least according to Sukuna, that Sumiki die by the Ten Shadows technique. You know, to ensure maximum depression sets in. But this is just unfucking acceptable to Yorozu, who begins stomping on the ground and shattering the earth beneath her. As construction begins building some form of carbon material around her body, Yorozu is disgusted Sukuna would taint his future wife's corpse with a curse technique besides his own. Angering her beyond belief, Yorozu reveals her ultimate creation, flesh-based insect armor that prioritizes close and mid-range combat, powering Yorozu up to her peak attack and defensive strength. Sakuna, seeing this as the perfect opportunity to test out even more of the Ten Shadows technique, clearly not even beginning to understand the brink of the problem with this one, smiles as the Dharma Chakra Wheel, Divine General Maharaga's signature adaptation symbol, appears over his head. But this smile can't last long on Sakuna's lips as Yorozu displays her impressive speed with insect armor, instantaneously punching Sakuna right in his mitt, the first time the king's face has ever been 
muddied throughout the entire series. Unfazed, Divine Dogs are conjured once more. But again, Insect Armor makes Yorozu an untamable menace in close quarters. Landing another head-on strike, Yorozu taunts the king, claiming at this point she's leaving him with no choice but to use his curse technique. Sukuna is clearly on the back foot, and Yorozu continues lashing forward, screaming at the vengeful spirit to cut her open and see that it's true, that her heart beats only for him. And if he can't see that, she'll just completely eviscerate him in the process. As the liquid metal surrounds Sukuna entirely, the king looks through the open hole with the complete opposite of love. Not hatred, but indifference. The king makes his hand sign, and a large deer emerges with Sukuna as the liquid metal immediately dissipates with its summoning. A Shikigami that not only heals through a radiating aura of reverse curse technique, its ability also neutralizes all foreign energy in its range. And next, the follow-up, a hand sign for a piercing ox. And on command, a shadow in the shape of a bull charges Yorozu down. As the Shikigami tears through the stadium with Yorozu on its horns, the overwhelming strength of insect armor can't be ignored. She tosses the bull aside like the nuisance it is. And just as she punches it away, the bull again readies itself for another charge. And Yorozu realizes is its gimmick. So quick, the Shikigami looks like it teleports when ripping forward in a straight line. The further a piercing ox is from its target, the stronger its attack becomes. And this time, it hits Yorozu with enough power to pierce a section of her insect armor. But before she can even try and grasp the situation, she becomes surrounded by rabbits. And at this point, the King of Curses is truly beginning to come into his own with the usage of the Ten Shadows. Standing high above the stadium, he chuckles and wonders if Yorozu will be able to keep up with the pressure. As from up high, whistling with speed and crashing down like a truck comes Max Elephant with full intentions and full body weight striking down to crush Yorozu like a flattened pancake. And as the force of the drop ripples through the stadium, clearing the area of smoke, Yorozu emerges from her insect armor, damaged but not out for the count. How can Yorozu die when she knows no one will even be able to teach the King of Curses about love if she's gone. But Sukuna snickers, almost as if it's laughable to think she would be the first to teach him about love. In denial, Yorozu's limits break, and she doubles down on her delusions of grandeur. If she can't have Sukuna, no one can. Remembering back to when she first laid eyes on her crush, Yorozu smiles, thinking there's no way Sukuna will be able to avoid using Shrine after this. And suddenly, a sphere, what Yorozu claims to be a perfect one, to be exact. Something thought to be impossible in the realm of physics, because a perfect sphere has no contact area. It generates infinite pressure, and by using the perfect sphere's disastrous effects in tandem with Yorozu's innate technique, the Hei and Error Sorcerer traps the King of Curses inside her domain expansion. Threefold Affliction. With the sphere guaranteed to hit and reduce Sukuna to dust once Yorozu activates its effects, she is dumbfounded that Sukuna hasn't opened his own domain to protect himself. But right at this moment, so subtly, even Yorozu herself couldn't notice. The Dharma Chakra wheel above Sukuna turns a knob, and upon Sukuna's call, from the shadows emerges the Divine General himself, trump card of the Ten Shadows, Maharaga. Throughout the entire fight, adapting to Yorozu's curse technique while Sukuna was supposedly getting pushed around, the entire makeup of Perfect Sphere was ineffective against a Maharaga that has already seen and adapted to construction. With one slash of its blade, Maharaga destroys the sphere, and with it, Yorozu's domain. Winding back for a second swing, as Yorozu can only stand in awe, her territory shatters as Maharaga brings down the final blow. Yorozu, lying in a pool of her own blood, is, ironically, happy. Sakuna would have taken so much time to get to know her that well. In her own twisted way, the King of Curses validated her love. And in return, Yorozu offers the rest of her life in exchange for giving Sukuna a gift. As if the King of Curses really needed to come away from this entire situation with more. And with the death of Sumiki's body, Sukuna not only tightens his grip on his vessel, Fushiguro Megami's spirit sinks deeper into the darkness. His main reason for even living taken from this world by his own hands. The next time we see the King of Curses, he's showing up in the nick of time.
time to protect Kenjaku from Satoru Gojo's return. And after exchanging pleasantries, the two vow to meet on Christmas Eve to settle the score started on Chapter 3 of the entire series. The Honored One, Satoru Gojo, the strongest sorcerer of the modern era, awaits his challenger, the King of Curses, the pinnacle of sorcery from the Heian era, Ryomen Sukuna, in the demon-infested ruins of Shinjuku. A battle to top off a year of absolute chaos. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see me cover Gojo vs Sukuna next, get this video to 5,000 likes. Subscribe if you enjoyed and want to see more content like this. Check out an end screen video if you want to continue your binge, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.